going to be uh, from the book of Acts, chapter 2, the first 13 verses, uh, as we remember the day of Pentecost in church history. You know, there are a lot of different uh, myths and legends behind the, the founding of certain organizations and corporations and countries and whatnot. Uh, we've got plenty of them around the fun and founding of this country, the various things that happened uh, at that Continental Congress in order to come up with the various compromises and the, and the writing of the Declaration of Independence and all of that. And we celebrate that every 4th of July and we remember that sort of thing. Um, and we read this morning our text from the text in Genesis chapter 15 where Abram sealed the covenant with God to make him the founder of his people, of God's people. And we saw the ceremony that's involved in that, the sacrifices and the fire. But I don't think any of those kinds of stories can compare with the founding of the church. The, the wonder uh, of this chapter that we are going to study here this morning the, how memorable it was and how, how, how many people were involved especially as well. So let's look at the text this morning and see uh, what we have to learn. Starting with just verse 1, verse 1 of chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Uh, it says the day of Pentecost came, and that means something different for us because we're looking back and remembering Pentecost as the day the church was founded. But it actually is also a Jewish celebration. Exodus 23, uh, 14 says, Three times a year you're to celebrate festivals to me. The people were told to gather at Jerusalem three times a year to celebrate. The first was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that begins on the evening of Passover and continues for there, from there. So they would have already celebrated that in this year. The second one was the Feast of Harvest, also called the Feast of Weeks, because it occurred seven weeks and a day after First Fruits. And First Fruits is the second day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You got all that so far? You need a calendar to try to keep track of it all. We also call the Feast of Weeks Pentecost. That is the Greek name for it. That is what they called it, because it was 50 days after uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the last one is the Feast of Ingathering, which is at the end of the year, also called the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. And we're familiar with that. So this is the second of the three annual Jewish festivals to celebrate uh, before God. And they were all gathered together in one place. Who's the they we're talking about here? From the last chapter, we get some, some clue as to that. They were the people who believed in Jesus. The twelve disciples, and I say twelve because in the last half of chapter one, we have the choosing of the twelfth disciple of a new person to replace Judas, and that's Matthias. So we have twelve once again. But we probably also have some of the 120 other people who are mentioned in chapter one of Acts as being followers of Jesus. Jesus' mother, Mary, his brothers, some of them were there. So they were all gathered together in one place. That was their custom. They gathered together in prayer because, as you remember, Jesus told them, stay here in Jerusalem. Wait the coming of the Holy Spirit. He told them to do it, so here they are. They're still waiting. They don't know how long it's going to be, but they're here waiting. Let's look at the second, third, and fourth verse. Starting in verse 2. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. It begins with the sound of a violent wind, which is an interesting description. This takes place indoors. But the house is evidently filled with the sound of wind, but not wind. I don't know what that's like. I've never heard wind without actually feeling the wind. Uh, but the house was filled with the sound of a violent wind. Uh, we've had some pretty good windstorms lately uh, with our spring weather. Imagine that sound inside of your house. It would obviously be something that would get your attention. And Luke tells us that it came from heaven, that sound. How did he know that? Perhaps he just 
surmised that from what the sound preludes, from what's going to happen next. Or basically, maybe he said, hey, where else is the sound of wind going to come from if not from heaven? It was clearly a sign. And what followed next was even more so. They saw tongues of fire, it says. Tongues of fire, an interesting description. All these slides have artwork uh, that, found that centers around Pentecost, and you'll see the different ways people, artists, have tried to interpret what tongues of fire must look like. So we'll see that as we go. But it was witnessed by everyone in the room. They all saw these flames splitting up, as it says, and stopping above each person. Now, you're, now what must have been going through their minds at that time? This is a unique moment. This is not something they would have expected to see coming. Were they afraid? Maybe some were. Or did, was it obvious to them? Was it obvious to them that fire was a sign from God? Because these are people who know their Old Testament scriptures. They know the many times that the presence of God has been signified by fire. And in your brain, you're probably thinking, hmm, what were those? What were those? Well, we read about the covenant. When God sealed the covenant with Abram, fire passed between the two sides. But we also know that when God spoke to Moses, he did so out of a bush that burned but was not consumed. Fire. But we also know that when God led his people out into the desert, it was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So many times when the presence of God was seen, it was by fire. Deuteronomy 4.24 says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. Once again, using that metaphor. So perhaps these people gathered together as soon as they saw the fire knew that it was the presence of God. And then they wouldn't have been afraid. They saw them come to rest on each and every believer. That's significant. It was not reserved for an elite. It didn't just come to the twelve apostles and rest above them. It was for everybody. It was needed by all and given to all. From the very beginning, a sign that this new covenant is going to be a little bit different. Oops. It also told us that they were filled by the Holy Spirit. This marks the beginning of the church age. It is a new sign of followers of Yahweh. In the past, in the Old Covenant, being a descendant of Abraham and a follower of the law were the tests of acceptance. If you could claim both of those, you could say, I'm a child of God, I'm a follower of Yahweh. I'm a Jew. That's how they decided, they signified such things. Who your parents were was important and what we did. Well, now it's going to change. Now, who your mother was doesn't matter. And I say mother because in Judaism, your lineage is reckoned through your mother. If your mother was Jewish, you're Jewish. If your father wasn't, you still are. That's not going to matter anymore. Anyone on whom the Spirit comes to rest is a member of the family of God. Well, that might not be quite so evident in this group, because as far as we know, all the members of this group are Jewish. And so perhaps it would not be quite so obvious this early that things have changed. But things have changed. The past is the past and we are starting a new path. In the Old Covenant, the Spirit filled men and women who had a purpose, a specific purpose in the will of God. They needed to perform a task or fill a role. And so the Spirit came and filled them. It was temporary. It would come and it would go. And it could be taken away. The most famous example is probably King Saul, who was filled with the Spirit, but because of his disobedience, the Spirit of God left Saul. So it was different. We have already seen a sign in the Gospels that a change is coming, however. If you think back to the beginning of the Gospels, when you think of the story of John the Baptist, Luke himself, who was writing Acts, said that. Luke 1.15, he will be a great in the sign of the Lord, in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take, to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. John the Baptist, filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. 
the one who would prepare the way of the Messiah, needed the power of the Holy Spirit from the very beginning. And this is also going to be a permanent solution. Much of what Paul is going to go on to write in his epistles is going to be dealing with this issue. What has changed in our relationship with God because of the permanent nature of the Holy Spirit? What implications does that have for us and what obligations does it put upon us? We read in Ephesians 1, Having believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. As Paul said, things have changed. This is permanent. It is a guarantee. And then something happened that is a little bit unusual. They started speaking in tongues, and we'll get into the details of that when we read the rest of the passage. But this was certainly a miracle that is a sign for everyone who was going to witness the advent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. More than that, it is foreshadowing of God's purpose in sending the Holy Spirit. He is going to preach the gospel to all peoples. Let's look at the text and see exactly what happened when, they, when the uh, believers started speaking in tongues. Verses 5 through 12. It says, Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews, from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and other parts of Libya, near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? In obedience to the covenant, as they were required to, Jews from all over the world have built Jerusalem for the festival. They were told, come to Jerusalem for the festival. They're here. And a crowd gathers in wonder. Uh, they are gathering because they are hearing the praising of God in all of these different tongues. They would not have expected to find anyone from Jerusalem who speaks their native tongue. That would have been rare, bump into someone who speaks what you speak. They would have probably been spending most of this trip speaking in Greek, conversing in the language of the day. That was the lingua franca of the day, the language that the common people knew throughout the known world. It was the most common language. And yet, here is this small group of people, this little knot of people, speaking to them in the language of home. Fifteen different regions were mentioned in that text. Probably more languages than that, because several of those lead regions are rather large and had multiple languages. There is no logical explanation for how this could be happening. How on earth all of us standing here in this crowd could be hearing our own language? If one or two of them had heard their language, maybe we could say, oh, it's just a coincidence, it's you know, we've got someone here who speaks this language and that language. But no, all of them at once. The first thing the crowd thinks on uh, hearing this is, wait a minute, aren't all of these men speaking here Galileans? Once again, their accent gives them away. I have no idea what kind of accent they had in Galilee, but it must have been pretty bad. Because Peter couldn't hide at the trial his accent. Every time he opened his mouth, they said, oh, you're one of his. It must have been a pretty serious accent. And they, even these visitors to Jerusalem can tell. When they're speaking in their own language, they've got that same accent. You don't lose your accent just because you start speaking a foreign language. Uh, it's, it's still there. It's a dead giveaway. This is not a region of the world known for its many scholars, but its linguists. It's further proof. This is not some sort of gimmick. This is not some sort of trick. They're amazed. It is clearly a sign from God 
religious leaders, from the Sadducees, the Pharisees, or the teachers of the law. This is a sign from God which is coming from a bunch of fishermen and whatnot from Galilee. It's amazing. The mystery deepens. What on earth is God trying to say? We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. So what was the message? What was the Holy Spirit prompting them to say on the day of Pentecost? Pentecost, excuse me. Talking about the wonders of God. Perfectly fitting in with the festival. That was why they were gathered here in Jerusalem in the first place. To praise God for keeping the covenant. To praise God for being God. For doing everything that God has done. That is the same thing these people are saying. But it is also preparation. It is preparation for Peter's sermon, which occupies the rest of the chapter, and we'll look at some other day. Peter's sermon about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the crowd asks, what does this mean? What does this mean? This is obviously a sign from God, but we don't know what he wants us to know. What does it mean? There is plenty of reason to be amazed and perplexed. Certainly, God is trying to deliver a message to his people. And he's delivering this message to all of his people. Even those who have been driven far from Jerusalem by oppression. Aren't they supposed to be in this land? This is their land, the land Abram was promised. And yet, God's message extends to those who have never even been to Jerusalem before. People who are scattered at the four winds. It extends to all of his people, even those who chose to leave Jerusalem, who said, you know what, there's nothing for me here. This place has not got the economic opportunities I need. I need to go to Rome. I need to go to Egypt. People who chose to leave the promised land. God is saying to them by speaking in their own language, I still have a message for you. Wherever you are, prepare to hear the word of the Lord. It is coming. So what is God trying to say? Let me just give us a preview from Peter's sermon. The conclusion of Peter's sermon in verse 36. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He spends the rest of the chapter explaining why that is. So let's talk for just a minute about the gift of the Holy Spirit. What is the purpose of the Holy Spirit? Why has this come to start the church age? Why is it necessary? Firstly, the Old Covenant wasn't sufficient. It was not sufficient to combat our sin nature. We couldn't keep our obligations to God, both positively. We couldn't do the righteous acts that the covenant required, and negatively. We couldn't avoid the sin that the, that the covenant forbade. Couldn't do it. The result was inevitable. God's judgment and God's wrath on his people. Time and time again, if you read the Old Testament, you see the people repent, God forgives them, they go for a while, and then they go back to their old ways. The book of Judges, again and again, the same way. The people throughout the covenant, they couldn't keep it. They didn't have the ability. It was too difficult. And now we are going to have a new and better way. You see, the cleansing power of the blood of the Lamb makes it possible for the Spirit of God to dwell within us. This is new. This was not possible before. God's Spirit couldn't dwell in an unclean vessel. Not going to happen. Only the perfect sacrifice of Christ could make this an option. That all believers could be a vessel for the Spirit of God. If God's people are going to walk according to His ways, if we're going to be the people we are supposed to be, we're going to need all the help we can get. That's why it's necessary. But what does it do? Why do we have the Holy Spirit as believers in Christ? What does it do for us and through us? A variety of things. One thing that it does is the Holy Spirit enables Christians to have a parent-to-child relationship with God, to be part of God's family. It's not a distant relationship. Muslims believe that God and man are totally separate, and you only approach God in fear and trembling. With the advent of the Holy Spirit, everything's changed. We can call God, Abba, Father. 
We can approach the throne of grace with confidence, as we do in the morning, every week when we pray here. The Holy Spirit empowers Christians to have victory over sin and temptation. Now, we're not talking about perfection. We're not talking about living a sinless life. But we are talking about the ability to say no to temptation and actually stick to it. The Holy Spirit gives us that power. The Holy Spirit inspires Christians to follow the example of Jesus Christ by putting others first and adopting a servant's attitude. No small thing, and not something we are going to be able to do on our own without power from God. And as it did on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit shows the world the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What's the difference between that day and this day? Well, in this day, the tongue that we speak in to share the gospel of Jesus Christ is our own. We are the sign from God to show our lost world the path home. If they don't hear in our words and see in our actions the gospel of Jesus Christ, they won't look on God's people in wonder as they did on the day of Pentecost. How will they look on us? They will look on us in pity and in scorn. One last verse to look at. Didn't forget about it. Verse 13. Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Makes me wonder, how much does it grieve God when he reaches out to his own creation and they spurn him? How much does it grieve God when he sends signs and wonders and prophets to encourage his children to repent and they turn and laugh in his face? How much must that hurt God? God's a person. That hurts. There will always be those who listen calmly to the music that's being played ever so sweetly as the Titanic is singing, who sit back and ignore all the clear evidence and choose not to accept it, who would rather drown than submit to God. Sadly, that will always be the case. We must share the gospel, but there will always be those who spurn it. However, our attitude should be thanks be to God, because there, but for the grace of God, go I. If not for the grace of God, we would be in that group too. We are not in that. We're just redeemed. That we responded when the Holy Spirit called us is nothing but the grace of God. Two brief words of application from our text this morning. One thing that we should take from this is that we should be encouraged by God's willingness to reach out to man again and again. Not only did he send his son, he sent the Holy Spirit to save sinners just like you and just like me. That should encourage us. And lastly, because we do have the Holy Spirit, we can indeed have victory over sin and live according to righteousness. We don't have any excuse left. We can do it.